Hello and welcome to It's a Code You, Mental Health Support for Those Working in Healthcare. This is a podcast created for healthcare employees to explore not only issues relating to mental and emotional health, but also unique challenges that those working in healthcare are faced with. Your hosts are Adina Tucker, a licensed clinical social worker with Dartmouth Health, and Jennifer Henze, an MSW also with Dartmouth Health. Hi, everyone. We are back. And this uh, episode, we are going to be talking about healthy sleep, what it looks like, what things you can do to improve your sleep, and what things might be making your sleep have a lower quality than you could. And today, we are lucky enough to have with us Dr. Jessica Sowen Dermer. And she is a clinical psychologist. She's currently working within the gastroenterology department. And most of her time is spent doing clinical research, including a clinical trial with CBTI, which is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia and Crohn's disease. And she previously has done a fellowship in behavioral sleep medicine with Johns Hopkins and has just a broad history in behavioral medicine. So we really appreciate her being here today because we all know sleep is something that is super important and affects a lot of things. Um, so I'll just kind of kick it off with what are kind of the basic components of healthy sleep? That's a great question to start with. And when I think about healthy sleep, I'm thinking about both quality and quantity. The number of hours that one needs to sleep per night is individually variable. We often kind of come in with this idea that we all need eight hours of sleep. And one of the things that I like to start off by telling patients is that that may not be true. For the average adult, we need typically somewhere between seven and nine hours, but there are folks who exist on the fringe there for whom, let's say, six hours or 10 hours are really necessary for daily functioning. And so that number of hours that sleep need is individually variable. That's kind of that quantity of sleep. And then we're thinking about quality of sleep. Does it feel like you're getting deep sleep at night? Do you wake up refreshed in the morning? Or does it feel like you're really tossing and turning and your sleep is light? So that's what I'm thinking about overall when I'm wondering about whether someone's sleep is healthy or whether we need to intervene in some way. That's great. I was wondering if you could describe the stages of sleep. Oh, yeah. So typically we think about sleep as occurring, well, in sort of in four-ish stages. Those can be broadly split into REM, rapid eye movement sleep. That's sort of when we think about dreaming and then non-REM sleep, the non-rapid eye movement sleep. Most of our sleep is non-REM, and we have three stages there. Stage one is very light. That's the stage that we cross into briefly. It's like our entrance into sleep from waking. That's the kind of sleep that you might feel if you doze off for a moment when you're the passenger in a car or watching a movie and you pop right back up, you are probably in stage one sleep. About half of our night is spent in stage two sleep. That's sort of our standard sleep stage. And then our deepest stage of sleep is that stage three or slow wave sleep. And we think about that as particularly important for our body sort of recovering and preparing for the next day. That's the, the deepest stage of sleep where, let's say, if your alarm goes off during that stage, it feels like you're just completely dragging your body up from like the pit of sleep. It's really hard to wake up. You feel so deeply exhausted when you wake up from that stage of sleep. That's that deepest stage. Most of that occurs earlier in our night. And then later in our night, we're more likely to have that REM sleep where we're dreaming. And then during that REM sleep, we typically experience a lot of dreaming. We have our our active mind, but our body is supposed to be quiet. Um, Our bodies are not really supposed to move around much during REM sleep to sort of protect us from all that dreaming that we're doing. I was thinking about how people with with children sleep is one of those things that we really want to figure out <laughs> because if our children aren't sleeping then neither are we and there's always you know like i had a routine with with my kids where we would have dinner and then we play a little bit and we do the bath and the book and all the things is there such thing as a healthy sleep routine as an adult and if so what would that what would be the components of a healthy sleep routine for you know, a grown person? I think that's a great question. I, and I love your example because what I often say to adults, to my own patients is that 
We think about these things for kids. We think you do bath, story, teeth, bed, and it's like a boom, boom, boom every night. And for some reason that sort of falls off in adulthood, but there's there's no magic in particular here. Like that stuff that works for kids, having that same order of events every night is optimal in adults as well. So it might look a little bit different. Maybe we're not doing story time, um, but maybe you are having the same cup of tea every night, reading a chapter in your favorite book, and then you are washing your face and getting in your pajamas and then going into bed, right? And so there's that same order of events that prepares you. We get those cues every night that we're about to go to sleep. And it's still really helpful to have those three or four things that might be spread across half an hour that prepare your brain and body for what's to come next. Great. And that actually makes me think about a lot of the advertisements I've seen for the red lights to induce sleep. Can you talk about how maybe incorporating uh, red light into a sleep routine can be helpful? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I, I to be honest, have seen fewer of those red light devices. Um, however, I do tend to think clinically about the amount of blue light that you're getting. So I think op is operating in, across those same principles. Typically, we do want to limit blue light in the evening, especially close to our eyeballs. So like a TV screen that's 10 feet away from us is going to be not so bad as a phone that we're holding right up near our face to watch a little video. Um, I also tend to be more careful with light exposure in my patients who are night hours, owls, excuse me, who might be more prone to be alerted by those blue light cues. So in terms of those red light devices that you're talking about, I would wonder if maybe those are sort of supporting the not using our white light or blue light devices in the evening, not getting as much of that wavelength of light that tends to be more arousing and therefore not as compatible with falling asleep. I like how you mentioned the the whole blue light because I I feel like one thing I've know I've done myself or I've heard other people do is when they're having trouble falling asleep they go oh, I'll just scroll my phone until I get tired. So it's good to know that that is not going to get me what I want which is to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Are there other certain things that contribute to like an ideal sleeping situation or or that maybe are very bad, like the opposite of an ideal sleeping situation? Yeah, great question. So I want to, in order to answer this, differentiate people who sort of want to make sure their sleep is good and clean from folks who clearly have chronic, clinically less significant insomnia. Um, sleep hygiene is an intervention we hear about a lot. And it, depending on where you look, can mean a lot of different things, which is why it gets sort of tricky. Sleep hygiene tends to include things like limiting alcohol or nicotine or other stimulants before bed, limiting excessive water or liquid intake, not being on screens in your bed, that kind of thing. All of those are meant to reduce arousal and keep your relationship with your bed as one of sleep and not one of you know, lots of other things. So sleep hygiene is great if you're in this position where you're like, my sleep isn't amazing, but I don't have insomnia and I just want to make sure I'm doing stuff right. All of those sleep hygiene behaviors are excellent. If you have insomnia, sleep hygiene is not going to cut it. Um, you need real insomnia treatment in that case. Typically, that first line treatment would be cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Sleep hygiene is part of that treatment, but it is not going to be the thing that really um, makes the biggest difference in terms of your symptoms. So back to those tips you were asking about, I would be making my room cool, dark, and quiet. I would be keeping the phone, the TV, the email, the, the book out of the bed optimally. If you want to do those things for a few minutes when you get in bed, like I don't think that that's a huge issue. It's the watching a full movie when you get into bed, you know, reading for two hours. Those are going to get you in trouble long term because they're going to teach your brain, oh, this is the place where I email or pay bills or do lots of other things, as opposed to this is the place where I sleep. And we want to keep reinforcing that idea. This is the place where I sleep to our brains. So on that, is there... Is there room for technology to play a role in helping us improve our sleep? So I've seen a lot of different apps and all kinds of things, 
But I know we also want to reduce the blue light and the stimulation stuff. But is there a place for technology? I think there is if used mindfully. You know, I hear from a lot of folks that they're doing things like listening to like bedtime stories apps. And if you cannot fall asleep no matter what without that bedtime story app, I, I would be a little iffy there. But if you live in a place where there's a lot of street noise or noise from the apartment next door and you sort of like you need to do this based on what your living situation is, then it's absolutely appropriate. And I think I would encourage that. Um, there's lots of different apps that will sort of help you just put your brain on something as opposed to worries so you can get to sleep. I, I tend to like those, that, that kind of thing, especially if you need to drown out environmental noises. The other place that I think technology can be really helpful is in passive monitoring of sleep. What I don't want to see patients do is to constantly think about their sleep because that creates this idea of worrying of hypervigilance, of being extra, extra aware of what's going on, which increases arousal and decreases sleep. It's going to do the opposite of what you want to do. But if you are to, for example, put a sleep tracking device actually under your mattress, and if you feel like after a few days or a few weeks, oh, it's been a rough week, let me just check in on that. And it's sort of like that once a week check-in or as needed check-in, that's going to be very different than taking a look at your watch every single morning and then making decisions about your day based on whether you've gotten enough hours or not. I'd much rather you sort of tolerate a little bit of fatigue, move on, keep your same sleep schedule than checking every single day for the foreseeable future. That makes a ton of sense. And I didn't even know there were sleep tracking devices you could put under your mattress. I know there are ones for all sorts of other things with like babies and even alarms for those in the deaf community, but that's pretty interesting. You Earlier, you talked a little bit about alcohol and how that can affect your sleep. So I don't know, some people, when they can't sleep, they're like, oh, let me have a drink to kind of relax me. How does alcohol consumption affect your sleep, especially if you're someone who maybe has like a glass or two of wine or something every single night? Yeah. So if you're having, I think, like a glass of wine with dinner every night from a sleep specific perspective, you know, there may be enough hours between when you're having dinner and when you're going to bed. I mean, if you're having dinner at 630, let's say and you're going to bed at 1030, most of that alcohol is gone. I don't think that's a huge issue. I mean, there's probably other questions that we in the mental health field may be having if somebody's maybe not having one, but two or three glasses every night. Where I get concerned is where there's, you know, that increased volume of alcohol and where it gets closer to bed. Alcohol tends to do this funny thing where the first half of your sleep tends to be quite deep and then the second half is very restless. So you'll end up with this mixed experience of like, I slept really heavily, but why am I still so tired? And it can, because of that, help you fall asleep, but it doesn't help you stay asleep. And so it ends up really just kicking the can down the road for insomnia. So it seems like melatonin is everywhere and even kids can get it over the counter. But I'm wondering if there's any harm in regularly taking it for sleep. So some of that will depend on what dose you're taking. In most of the clinical trial literature that I'm aware of, the highest dose that they tend to test is 10 milligrams. And then, and you do see some side effects with that dose. You see things like grogginess and headaches. Typically, if we are encouraging someone to use melatonin for sleep onset insomnia, we would be encouraging like between one and three milligrams and even less if we're using it for somebody who has a, a sleep-wake phase disorder, like being a night owl. That being said, you know, melatonin is not well-regulated. You never know exactly how much you're actually getting when you're taking that pill. There's also not a lot of great evidence on the use of melatonin for insomnia compared to the other treatments we have. So back to that question, is there harm? Maybe. It depends on how much you're taking. Um, it depends on other you know, uh, physical or mental health conditions. So if you're um, somebody who has a neurodegenerative disorder, somebody who's taking blood thinners, we definitely don't want to uh, include melatonin there. Um, but I would also typically just be encouraging somebody to engage in other sleep treatments that we know are more directly helpful for their insomnia. 
I was wondering if there are any mental health issues that can maybe be brought to the surface because of a continued lack of sleep or an issue with insomnia or that are just exacerbated by a lack of quality sleep. Oh yeah, absolutely. Both mental health and physical health issues. I think we've probably all seen this in our patients and in our friends and family themselves, where when you're not sleeping, things get kind of rough. You know, one of the core things that we see clearly in the data is that depression is a very common consequence of insomnia. So we see that insomnia will predict both initial and subsequent episodes of major depressive disorder. So that tends to be kind of an order of events there where insomnia can bring on or really worsen depression. We can also see that sleep deprivation may lower folks' threshold for having a manic episode. So this could be something that we're considering both in terms of insomnia, but also sleep treatment in somebody with bipolar disorder. Those are the areas where we see the most direct impact. But that being said, I think that when you're not sleeping, you are really not at your best. We've we've probably all had the experiences of being more irritable, uh, being less able to regulate our emotions, having all of these sort of general overall worsening of mental health issues across the board when we're not sleeping well. And maybe we can handle, you know, one or two nights of poor sleep, but when you have that every day for weeks or months or years, it really wears you down both mentally and physically as well. So can you tell us why CBTI over other treatments first? I'm I'm not sure that a lot of folks have heard of CBTI or are aware that it exists, but it really sounds like it's a very effective sort of intervention. Yeah. So cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, it is considered the first line treatment for insomnia, like you mentioned. And I think the core reasons there are because it's uh, short term, just as effective as um, pharmacotherapy for insomnia. And then long term, the effects of CBTI persist, where if you stop taking medication, it stops working. You don't tend to learn better sleep behaviors when you're taking medication for your sleep problem. There also aren't really side effects with CBTI the way that there might be with medication. We're not as concerned about, you know, interactions with other meds or things like that. So I I really encourage folks, if they're a candidate for CBTI, to go down that road because you can, you know, not for everybody, but for a lot of people actually fix the problem as opposed to covering it up and then having it to deal with it later on. I was going to ask, because we talked, or you mentioned a little bit about mental health, but also physical health. And I know that some of your work has been with obesity. So is there a link between poor sleep and weight gain? Or if someone is trying to get to a healthy weight, if their sleep is not where it should be, can that possibly hinder you from losing weight? Yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of people working in this area right now. I will say that, you know, ob- obesity, the disease or struggling with weight loss, struggling with body size is really a complex medical issue and I would want to be careful in how I answer this because I don't think that sleep is going to like fix the problem if there even is a problem, right? I mean, this is a complex physical social I- issue that optimally is treated in a team way. That being said, I think there's some really neat research that exists out there on things like timing of your largest meal and weight loss. There's also some interesting data on if you tend to be a short sleeper in particular and potentially a short sleeper with poor sleep, like that's the worst case scenario, then long-term that has a lot of consequences, one of which does tend to be weight gain or the inability to lose weight. But all of this also can potentially be affected by lots of other social or metabolic issues as well. A lot of the work that I'm doing now still uh, focuses as well on um, gastrointestinal symptoms, inflammatory bowel disease, and pain. I mean, we do see across a lot of other populations that, especially in this day-to-day format, when we look at how people are doing, a poor night of sleep predicts the next day pain quite well across lots of different kinds of pain. And so in in my work with patients, I'm often thinking about treating insomnia as a strategy for managing pain. 
because pain, you know, similar to, in some ways to obesity, pain is complex, it's multidimensional, it's really hard to manage, and it's really hard to live with sometimes. And so when we're thinking about how we can optimize somebody's pain control, if there are sleep problems, that's where I'm focusing my work. If I'm working with somebody with insomnia and who is potentially trying to lose weight or struggling with obesity, I might want to optimize their sleep just for their own quality of life, but I probably wouldn't be doing that in order to try to um, optimize or control their weight loss. So we've heard of the connection between the gut and the mind, right, and mental health. Is there a connection between like the microbiome and our sleeping habits? Yeah, so from what I have read, not being a microbiome expert myself, if anything here, what it tends to look like is that the microbiome diversity may predict insomnia as opposed to vice versa. So there may be something there. I think microbiome research is really fascinating, but also this bit of a black box where we're seeing all this interesting um this interesting work emerge, but not knowing exactly what it means in terms of treatment or um, clinical implications or sort of what's predictive of what. That's fascinating. That is really interesting. As someone who has stomach issues, I find it very interesting, actually. (laughs) What are, for people who stay asleep fine, but it may take them a while to fall asleep, is there anything, any kind of like tips or just for those that maybe don't have very severe sleep problems, but they just have trouble kind of settling down. Are there any things that can help with that initial falling asleep? Yeah. So for those folks, I'd be wondering if this is sort of lives in an anxiety camp or a night owl camp and maybe both. It can definitely be both of those things, but are you having trouble falling asleep because your brain just really doesn't think it's bedtime and you're getting in bed at a time that your body's not ready In that case, I might be brainstorming with that person, are there ways that we can shift your sleep schedule so that you can sleep at a time that's more consistent with your natural circadian rhythms? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, but um, often you might be able to potentially cut down on a few tasks in the morning or start something later or share tasks with a roommate or partner or spouse, change that schedule a little bit so you end up sleeping better and feel more functional during the day. So that's in that circadian rhythm camp. If this lives more in that heightened arousal, heightened anxiety camp, then I might suggest doing work around relaxation and arousal reduction, not in bed and not in order to fall asleep, but to really teach your body to reduce arousal and to prepare it for eventually going to sleep. So maybe an hour before bed out in the living room, you might do some mindfulness or progressive muscle relaxation using apps like Mindfulness Coach or Headspace or Calm or some of the things that we've seen out there. But that would both teach your body, like I said, to reduce arousal more quickly and help you get into that mind space for being able to go to sleep. In both of those cases, you know, back to our our light discussion, we might want to be thinking about and managing the light exposure in the evening. So if you're like me and you turn on every single light in the house, that might not be helpful if you're having a hard time going to sleep. Maybe you need to get some smart bulbs. Maybe you need to sort of manage what the exposure looks like to get your environment to help you reduce that arousal as well. I have a follow-up question that is just a little selfish, honestly, about the light because the light is a constant conversation in my household because during the day... (laughs) I like daylight to come in. I'm fine with it being dimmer at night, but the other household member wants it to be dark constantly. Is there any sort of research that shows that, <laughs> you know, that you're right? Yeah, that that I'm right, that we need it to be <laughs> daylight, that it helps with our sleep. <laughs> uh I mean, yes, optimally, when you're waking up in the morning, you do want to get some bright light exposure and have your brain know that it's daytime and it's wake up time. That actually does, you know, the light exposure will help melatonin suppression, whereas when the light disappears, this is where the melatonin starts. We have our dim light melatonin onset. 
So regulating our light appropriately does help with both the wake promoting and sleep promoting processes that occur biologically. So just play your partner that clip later. <laughs> oh, I don't know if either of you are familiar with that 90s dance hit, Rhythm of the Night. <laughs> but when I think of Rhythm of the Night, I've always thought of this circadian rhythm. But could you just kind of give a brief overview for folks who are not too familiar with what the circadian rhythm is and, and just what it does for us in our sleep? Yeah, so we are, there are pacemakers throughout our body. Our central circadian rhythm is regulated by light exposure through our optic nerve and our eyeballs. Um, and that's sort of the key timekeeper for how our bodies know when it's wake time and sleep time. Um, so there are lots and lots of different like biological processes that go into that. Melatonin is one we talk about quite often, but everybody has their own sort of natural circadian rhythm that's not exactly the same. So many of us may be able to sleep that, you know, 11 to 7, sort of generally speaking time frame. That's like a typical or, or average circadian rhythm. But there's also folks who are night owls who may not feel tired until 2 a.m. Um, if you're a night owl, it's really hard to operate in this world where work starts at 8 for a lot of people because that's not the, the timeline that your body and brain are programmed to operate on. And that's biological. It's genetic. There are things that you can do to manage circadian rhythm disturbances, but they're all about management. You can't really change them forever or fix them in some way. I talk about night owls more because that's what tends to be both more common in the population, but also more impactful in terms of being able to go to bed at a time that prepares you for work or school the next day. We do see early birds as well. People who let's say are waking up at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, ready to go when the rest of the world is asleep. And that's really difficult in its own ways. So it doesn't tend to necessarily drive insomnia the way that being a night owl might. Really interesting. You know, recently I read about, what was it, like a colonial sleep pattern of having nighttime wakings. And it was just a very common thing to get up in the wee hours, go do some tasks, and then go back to bed for a bit. I'm wondering, do you think there was a real benefit to that? And I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing that out there because I thought that was kind of odd. <laughs> this might not even go in the in the podcast. But... Yeah. <laughs> I think I read an article about that recently. Well, there were, it, it showed up somewhere recently. I mean, there were obviously benefits to it in colonial times when like the cows needed to be dealt with right. at 4 a.m. or something. Yeah. I'm not sure that there would be yeah. now because that's quite different than what our social mm -hmm. world is. But that is... I mean, that's different, you know, I'm, as I'm saying that, that's the social world that we live in here in our culture in this country that may not be the same across cultures, and it may not be the same across different countries. Yeah. So I, I think that that probably is quite socially driven. And there are people who come in with biphasic sleep patterns like that, but often it's a, it's coming in with a complaint. And, and wondering sort of what to do with it, as opposed to like, this is really helpful for me. I have seen patients who do that, who sleep for a few hours, get up and do a bunch of tasks. Sometimes they do work during the night and then they sleep for a few more hours. I would say if it's functional for you, if you're physically and mentally healthy in doing that, I, you know, there may not be a problem. Some of this is biologically driven. So there's my guess is a lot of different processes that go into whether that's useful or not, or healthy or not. Yeah, the cultural influence on sleep, I think, is really interesting. Do you, do you feel like you see a lot more, I know you said you deal with a lot more folks who are night owls in the population that you deal with, but do you think that's driven by, like, the technology piece, just how we are operating as a society? So, a lot of my work is in inflammatory bowel disease, where we do see that there are higher rates of being a night owl, and there are some um, genetic, there's like some shared genetic variants between inflammatory bowel disease and 
circadian rhythms. Um, so there are specific reasons why I'm seeing more of that in particular in my current practice and in the research that I'm doing. You know, I think that probably technology doesn't help. There's lots of things that we can do late at night on demand in a way that probably for all of us when we were kids, like TV got really boring after 11 and like, okay, maybe you could go play a computer game by yourself in the dark, but like there just wasn't the degree of stimulation available that there is now. So that may, it, whether it's driving people being night owls, whether it's making it easier to be a night owl, uh, I, there could be a lot of good questions there. I have a question because our whole focus of the podcast is specifically people who work in healthcare and, sh and certainly not everyone who works in healthcare does shift work, but you know, a, there are, there are a lot of people in various forms, not just nursing, but that, that do shift work where they work overnights. How does that impact sleep? And is it something that is there a way to still have good, healthy sleep and not end up with something like insomnia if you do shift work? Yeah, definitely. I mean, shift work is hard on the body for sure, um, especially rotating shift work. So people that are on off, on off, as opposed to like kind of everyday night shift workers or earlier or late shift, it tends to make it harder when you're always trying to catch up and operate on low sleep. That being said, those transition points between shifts or between operating on a day versus a night schedule tend to be, I would say, more critical time points for managing sleep and for managing fatigue, both for your own health and for the health of the patients that you're taking care of. So there's lots of different adaptations that folks can do to manage sleep in those contexts. Things like you know, before a long shift, they might try to get extra sleep. They might, so taking a nap a few hours before the shift, they might use caffeine, they might do a lot of bright light exposure to make sure they're awake before that shift. Caffeine is something you can kind of keep going through the first half of your shift, and then you really want to maintain that light exposure. And then near the end of the shift, this is when you're going to be, again, managing light exposure in a different way. So you might turn on that night shift setting on your phone or on your computer. You might use blue light blocking glasses or, or during the end of your shift or sunglasses on the way home so that your body will stop getting those wake promoting signals and potentially get that dim light melatonin onset that you will be wanting it to get. I tend to, the, the blue light blocking glasses, I tend to very broadly tell people that if you can't see that there's a color there, it's likely not very helpful. So you can order glasses that have like a blue light filter on them that are supposed to be probably for computer work, eye fatigue, that kind of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. Like those, they should be yellow or red or something. You should be able to very clearly see that there's a lens there changing the color of the world around you if you're using it for that reason. Um, and then you know, there comes all those sleep hygiene things. So when you're actually going to bed, preparing yourself, reducing arousal, um, people who are on shift work absolutely need those um, uh, blackout curtains. If you're sleeping during the day, often some of those noise canceling, um, whether it's uh, white noise or whether it's the bedtime stories, but things to cancel out surrounding noise if you're sleeping during the daytime become more necessary as well. That's very helpful because I know we do. I know even just patients that I work with for therapy, I have some that do shift work and they will sometimes flip between doing day shift and night shift. And, and that often messes with their sleep. They report probably need to start wrapping up. So I think the last question that I want to ask, and then Jennifer, if you have anything after this, we can ask that. But if someone is having significant sleep issues and having probably what's insomnia, what would you recommend is the first thing that they should do or the first place that they should turn to kind of start figuring out how to take care of everything? Yeah, uh, I, I would optimally encourage them to get a referral either to psychiatry where they can do quite a bit of insomnia treatment or to the sleep medicine center. 
you know, there if they have a Dartmouth PCP, there may be a social worker who's part of that or a licensed mental health counselor, part of that practice who might be able to do CBTI with them. We just did a, a training a few months ago. So there are a whole bunch of these folks who can do CBTI with patients. If you can't get in and see somebody quickly, there are apps and other sleep devices out there. My go-to is the Insomnia Coach app. That one is has been developed by the VA and is excellent and very evidence-based. They have a whole fleet of apps that are very good. The Insomnia Coach app in particular is free and pretty easy to use. So if you can't have easy access to our providers at Dartmouth, that's where I would go. Do you have anything else, Jennifer? I don't. I think that was all really great information and just appreciate you being here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. I think this is, I mean, sleep is always something people are always having questions about or complaining about. So I think that it's a very useful topic. And I mean, I I wrote, I have notes that I wrote down things that I'm going to do different just for myself. So yeah, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to help. Thanks. It was lovely to talk to you both. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us this week. As always, if you'd like more information and support, please check out our site at dartmouth-health.cobalt.care for additional content, connection to resources, support groups that you can sign up to attend, or to connect to one of our clinicians for counseling, psychotherapy, or medication evaluation. We appreciate you listening and hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you.